Cheers, guys. Epix 911, welcome to the Wednesday, March 1st edition of VR News. Can you guys freaking believe it? March, third month in the year. Time, time she goes fast, hella fast. But anyways, literally yesterday evening, as I'm editing the second video for the night, NVIDIA basically drops their bombshell, the release of their new flagship card, the 1080 Ti. And guys, this thing is an absolute beast. So let's answer the big question first, which is inevitably going to be performance. How does it stack up not only against the base card, the Founders Edition, but how does it fare compared to previous TI launches? And we can kind of answer both of those in about two sentences. So first off, last generation, the difference between the TI and its base card was roughly 20%. This time around, 35%. So that's significant difference uh, in performance over the base card. That is huge. What else changes with this card? This one's a bit of an odd one. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a replacement rather than a removal. And I'm talking about the DVI port on the back of the reference design. They basically removed the DVI, but they didn't replace it with a display port. You're left with what you would have left, which is three display ports and one HDMI. Now, for those of us who maybe connect to a fifth device, understanding, of course, it's four that are supported, it still saves me time crawling around hell's half acre underneath my desk, getting the TV set up when I can now just do it through software. So that one was a bit puzzling, but to be fair, they do throw in an adapter. So you get a DVI display port adapter thrown into the box. At the end of the day, yeah, okay, can live with that. Now, what else? Tiled caching. So L2 caching, much better optimized this time around. That's going to have a positive impact on game benchmarks, which we should start seeing in a few days. Thermal design, an enhancement in thermal design, which is essentially seeing a drop across overclocked, no overclocking, a drop of about five degrees Celsius, which is a pretty healthy drop in temperature. This next one I really like. It's what they're calling NVIDIA Aftermath. And so many times, you know, you get those memory dumps and you have that option to send it to Microsoft, for example, if it's an OS crash. Some people do, lots don't, and you're never quite sure unless you work at Microsoft, if they get acted on. Well, keep that in mind as I describe NVIDIA Aftermath. So what it is going to do is going to allow developers to classify GPU crashes by location and by type. So you're going to be able to get that detailed, which should help narrow down those cryptic bugs, almost as cryptic to the devs themselves, and figure out what the hell was going on that caused the GPU to crash in the first place. You can report that information in two ways. Right from the game, you're going to be able to do it, or generate a log file post-game and email that forward. Now, the, the last feature that I wanted to talk about, I'm just going to talk about in the second news item, and that is FCAT and the implications there. It's a new benchmarking suite. So... Let's just jump into that next story. Uh, NVIDIA also announced FCAT VR frame analysis tool. Now, what this is supposed to do, according to Road to VR, is demystify the whole process behind benchmarking virtual reality. Depending on what source you read, whether it's you know tried and true 3D Mark who've been in the game for a long time, everybody's got a different interpretation of what classifies you know, as a reliable indicator for VR performance. There's a few different theories floating out there. What I like about FCAT is their approach to VR benchmarking. It's a really logical, lateral, straight-thinking approach. So what this does, this frame time analysis tool, is it's able to monitor frame time, 
detailed timing on your frame time. And frame time is huge, specifically with the 90 frames per second requirement that we have. And whether you use reprojection or not, 90 frames per second, it's that magic mark that we always try to hit. So it measures frame time, it measures dropped frames, what they're calling warp misses, and they describe a warp miss whenever the runtime, so the, the underlying code, fails to produce a new frame or a reprojected frame in the current refresh interval. So without getting too technical with something like vSync, what you're doing is you're syncing, you're drawing to the screen with the screen's refresh rate. And when those match up, you get nice, smooth scrolling. You don't get those jaggies and the tearing. It's kind of similar to that. So you've got warp misses, and then the last thing it measures is synthesized frames, which are the ones that reprojection inject to allow you to hit that magic number of 90 frames per second. And I like their little summary on the description here, Road to VR, at the end they say, a synthesized frame is better than a dropped frame but it isn't as good as a rendered frame. Now, that sounds logical on the surface, but when you dig into it, it just shows you how simple yet elegant this benchmarking tool is going to be because you are literally going to be able to dissect the performance of your GPU, of the VR gamer experience you're running and see where the problem is specifically, which is very cool. So that is called FCAT. Next story, Oculus price cut. So, you know, you go for or from a couple of bad months for Oculus press wise, suddenly things are looking a little rosier. You've got some game announcements coming out regularly, quite the number of games, not to say that they're all stellar as in last night, but there's some decent games being announced. Well, now they're announcing a price cut on top of that. So the base Rift itself slashed $100 US, the touch controllers slashed $100 US. So whereas the entire price all in touch controllers was basically 800 bucks, now it's going to be 600 bucks. So couple that with price drops on the Founders Edition and Nvidia which are coming up. And you know what? That is a significant uh, budget shrink to get that ultimate gaming station. And, you know, people asked me a few months ago, what should I do? Should I purchase? Should I wait? And in most cases, I recommended you wait. And this is a perfect example of why. Now, of course, there's always going to be something better. But couple that and you're looking at together probably savings of about three to four hundred something dollars, which is not small, not a bad difference at all. So that's going to be a permanent price drop. It's not something that they're doing as a promotion. They literally want to reduce the barrier to entry, which of course, a huge component of that is cost. So good on Oculus for doing that. Of course, we talked about Vive, what they did with the financing options. Be curious to see if they do do a price drop themselves. Next story, also concerning Oculus, and it's just, there's been a lot of Oculus stuff at GDC, what can I say? We are going to get to some HTC Vive stuff though as well. So Jason Rubin, who we've also talked a lot about the last couple of weeks, had some interesting comments on wireless direction for VR and his thoughts on that. And they're not surprising in the sense that it's more of the same from Oculus, but they are surprising in the sense that you would have hoped they would have gotten it by now. And it seems they're still kind of missing the boat on what HTC is doing and what their MO is for the planning. Let me explain. So with Oculus, first time around, we heard about the gamepad versus the touch controller. But what did they ultimately do? They came out with a touch controller. We've heard about things like the chaperone system, which... They also didn't think were that important. What did they end up doing? Implementing Guardian. And sorry, but I kind of see this as just one more of the same thing. And there's nothing wrong with that. You can't blame them. That's 
how they want to do it. Fair enough. Well, you can blame them directly, but uh, <laughs> what I mean by that is it's within their right to do that, as crappy as it may be. So what's his reasoning this time for the wireless? We got or didn't agree with the touch, the chaperone system. What about this one? Well, Jason says it boils down to this statement. First of all, his feelings that it's compressed, not perfect and expensive. But then he goes on to say, if we add wireless, but it adds 200 to the price of the headset, I think we're moving in the wrong direction for right now. Some may want it. So as soon as a peripheral, uh, so as a peripheral, it's interesting, but I don't think it should be our focus right now. I think our focus should be on bringing the core experience we have down in cost before we add features. And I get that, but here's the difference as I see it. We're not talking about something like a controller where you want an almost one-to-one -one adoption rate. And I've beaten that to death. We don't have to get into that right now, but ideally you want one controller for every unit out there, period to get devs to want to use it and people to want to play those games that utilize the controller. We're talking here about something that is completely optional. So I agree with him that it should be a peripheral. That part I do agree with. But to say it's not important in the sense that he's using it, I don't agree with that because it's that's exactly the reason why they should do it because it doesn't take away from their focus. It's simply a peripheral that has absolutely no impact on what devs are going to do, unlike a controller. It's simply going to allow people to not be tethered or be tethered, but it won't really change the game itself. It'll change the experience, but that should be up to the consumer. So personally, I get his point, but respectfully disagree for that reason, right? I think you should have that choice as a consumer and they shouldn't be worried about throwing it out there for that reason. It's a peripheral. It's not a must have type device. What do you guys think? Love to hear your thoughts on that. Next story, uh, also GDC. We got a sneak peek, an actual hands-on, Upload VR did rather, with LG's Steam VR headset. Now, right off the bat, I'm going to throw some pictures up here of their controllers, which I personally think look freaking wicked. <laughs> like, I really like the way they look, especially when you've, of course, I don't have one around me right now. When you've been used to looking at the Vive controllers, even though these look obviously very Vive-like, I got to say, I like the aesthetic better with LG. Now, most of what they're offering is the same. It's the exact same you're going to get with HTC, just their version of it. But it's the same fundamental guts, the boards, everything is identical pretty much. But there is a difference and the difference is in the resolution. Now, if nobody takes advantage of it, it's not going to make much difference, but... Each eye is 1440 by 1280. You compare that to the Vive or the Rift where you're 1080 by 1200 per eye. That is almost one point, well, pixel wise, it's, yeah, about 600,000, 570, 560, thousand pixel difference, which translates to about 30%. So that is significant. And if it ends up being used right there, if all other things were equal, everything else. I would su suggest, especially if the cost is the same, that would be a good enough reason to go with the LG one just to have that better resolution. Because everything else, refresh rate 90, you've got the standard 110 degree field of view uh, and an OLED display from LG. Next news piece, uh, also a hands-on with Microsoft's first Windows holographic VR headset. Now, this was an Acer unit, and uh, again, it was Upload VR that got to try this. And I like it. He cuts right to the chase on his article, and he says, I'll get straight to the point. Inside the headset, I saw considerable motion blur while moving my head. Now, couple of things. Keep in mind, it's a prototype, and he points that out. This prototype was locked at 60 frames per second. So that's a huge drop from 90, which 
the retail units are going to be when they come out. So no doubt the motion blurring had something, who knows how much until we see the final units, but likely had something to do with that. Definitely a factor. Now, as for the tracking itself, he said it was pretty damn stable. And remember, this is a different tracking method that they're using. This is an inside out tracking method. And he seemed to think it worked well. He goes, as far as tracking is concerned, it worked without hitches, with the exception of one or two very brief moments where some stairs seemed to pop out of place a few inches and then quickly return. Now, he used an Xbox controller and a teleport locomotion system while he was trying it out. But other than that, he liked the experience. His big negative takeaway from that was the motion blurring. So that definitely is something we're going to have to revisit. The feature he liked the best, and he saved it right for the end of his article, was the flip up screen, which literally you flip up, don't have to remove your HMD and surprise, you see the real world. You can do stuff, eat, drink without having to take your HMD off. It's a simple thing. It's a subtle thing, but I think it's a nice thing to have. Again, all things being equal, for me, that would be a feature, a reason to get that over another unit. All right, still on the topic of Microsoft, they are also going to be shipping the dev kits for those HMDs this month. So within March and the holiday season coming up at the end of the year is when they plan on doing their full launch. So we should see an awful lot between now and then. Absolutely can't wait. All right, guys, I am going to be playing uh, a certain little free game in about a few minutes uh, with a three camera tracking. That's my goal for tonight. So hopefully if I get that all done, I can share that with you guys uh, here in a couple of hours. All right, guys, that is it for the news. Cheers. <laughs>